With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Ah, uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, he's one of our friends we go to on all this tech stuff because I don't understand it. He explains it so well. Even I understand it. He's gotten good at it too. You'll see him all over network TV, print, media, and podcasts like this one right here. James Ernowski, great to have you back, my friend. Thanks for having me. Yeah, he's a senior contributor with Young Voices, good friend of ours. You've been all over the place on this stuff. Two things I want to talk about. Let's start with AI, though, because... This has been up in your wheelhouse with this tech stuff you cover. Here's the thing with AI, though. I think we need to harp on the actual nomenclature of AI, mm -hmm. because I think when you don't get that right, you wind up all over the place on what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence is what AI stands for. A souped up search engine is not artificial intelligence. It is not Skynet. It's not going to take over the Internet. Those two things are different, and yet almost all the news media coverage I see, almost all the tech coverage I see, and all those Congress critters sitting on those dioceses, they're using that interchangeably to make policy. You got to start there with the differences between those two things, and then that's how you wind up with this policy being so bad right off the go. Nothing good's going to come out of this if we don't get this nomenclature correct, right? Oh, no, you're absolutely right there, Andrew. I think that the the we have not started off with our best foot forward when it comes to talking about AI. Um, I think that we use the term artificial intelligence and it's this very broad and nebulous term and it means a lot of things. And I think that because of that, we are kind of letting the conversation get distracted by unnecessary things or things that are unrealistic. I keep thinking back to when this was really kicking off, there was a letter that was signed by 350 different industry leaders and blah, 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 all about how AI needs to be taken seriously on the same level as nuclear war and, and you know, uh, ultimate waste and despair. And it's definitely something that, you know, while it's possible, is extraordinarily, extraordinarily unlikely. And the rhetoric just does not make any sense in terms of meeting the moment for where we're at on this technology. Um, it's a powerful tool. Uh, it's obviously not all sunshines and roses, but it's also not, to your point, Terminator fanfic, uh, end of the world kind of scenarios either. Um, I think that that's a massive mistake. I think AI... Uh, one thing that people don't realize is that it's been getting utilized for the last 20 years easily, I would say, um, in different ways that are more internal facing. And now it's just that we finally gotten the technology to be so promising and so powerful that we can actually start experimenting with how to put it in a more external facing role and interacting with the end user. And there, there are some really powerful things that can come out of that that are great for us as a society. So um, I wish that we would focus more on these nuanced conversations than just saying, AI, you know, uh, is going to kill people or it's going to do all these things that um, are not necessarily likely or probable for that matter. Yeah, James Arnowski joining us. This is why I like to talk to you about this, because you, you, you're you just a sadist. You just love punishment. You actually watch these hearings and all this stuff. The other side of this and why this has gotten to be a bit of a mess, though, is the big tech versus government thing. And AI is an offshoot of that. And it's actually becoming one of the main offshoots of that ongoing struggle. This is its own cottage industry, if you, for lack of a better term. There's a lot of money in this. You've been on this program before. You've talked about the money that Facebook and Google and these companies are spending on lobbying. They want a return on that investment. Part of the story here, though, is this is big business for and against, and it's big business for the government because it's more expansion of government regulatory policy. That's kind of the side part of why this is getting bigger and messier and louder that we're not really talking about. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think um, you think back to the first major hearing about AI where they brought in Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, um, the company that powers ChatGPT, the internet sensation uh, that kind of sparked the whole AI conversation, if you will, in many ways. Um, you know, he was sitting there advocating in front of Congress for licensing requirements for uh, powerful AI models. And I think that that's something that while he might genuinely believe in the and some of the downsides of the technology and the harms and all that, um, it's also impossible to ignore that those same proposals would position his company quite nicely uh, to benefit from a licensing regime because they're already there. Uh, and new entrants might not so easily be able to get into such a licensing regime, uh, you know, 
so easily. And I think that that's, that's bad. I think that that's cronyism and corporatism in ways that we don't want to be supporting. We support free market ways. We want to go and see um, this technology get supported, not stifled. And when you have members of Congress leaning into that, or, you know, I think the funnier thing from that particular hearing was, uh, it was Chairman Durbin saying like, oh, this is so historical that we have a, a business industry coming to us and asking and begging us to regulate them. I'm like, since when? That's like any day that ends in why everybody is going and lobbying for, uh, you know, something that benefits them in some rhyme or fashion. Uh, it's not unique to AI companies. Get out of here. Um, but no, it's very important in terms of the broader development of the technology that, you know, the United States gets the regulation, if any. Um, right. And I think right now, in part because of the inability to have a responsible and nuanced conversation around the technology, we're getting stuck with these very high, broad brush proposals that would go and actually encapsulate a lot of things uh, that are not just in, you know, the chat GPT, if you will, um, and that would actually be not so great. So I think that we need to do a better job of actually breaking down away from AI into more specific use cases and regulating narrowly tailored solutions around the harms that are being clearly identified there. And that's something that I think that we need to do a better job about. Yeah, James Janowski joining us. In your, you were writing in the New York Post about AI, you brought up China, you talked about the fact that, you know, part of the policy thing is it's one thing to be anti-China and China's policy. And we know about the dictatorship in China and all that. No, you don't want those kind of folks getting a technological advantage. But you'd warned that we got to be careful having policy just in the name of, you know, anti-China stuff where you don't want to hamstring ourselves. It's interesting you bring that up, though, because China has way more control over their populace and over the technology of their populace than we're ever going to have in America and they still can't make really strict restrictions on this stuff work. There's a lesson there in this, isn't it? As we go to try to do regulations, like, look, they're trying to keep kids off video games. They can't do it. They can't enforce it. And they've got almost a complete dictatorship. They're trying to control AI development and they can't control it because people are figuring this out and the open source is getting out there. There really is lessons to learn in the relationship of how China's doing this and applying them to how we do it, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. I don't think that the takeaway, and I think some Americans are making this mistake where they go and they point at China and think that that's a good thing. I'm like, especially in the context of video games and how they're handling, uh, you know, smartphone technology more broadly speaking right now, there was a recent proposal that they're considering to try to uh, limit kids access to smartphones to only a couple hours a day. Um, I think there's one lesson that people can learn. It's that, you know, people kind of get around all those controls. Um, speaking as a kid who had that, that control debate with my mom for years growing up. I assure you, we will find a way if we have the will. Um, you know, it's one of those things that I think is underappreciated. And I also think that at least when it comes to those proposals too, it, you've got to be careful, really careful because, you know, some people go and look at that and they want to cheer it on. But I hope they realize too, that the only way that it works is that China has an extraordinary amount of control over their population in ways that are very scary. And that's the only way they can enforce those particular rules in the ways that they want it to, right? So it's like, oh, you know, for kids getting off of video games, what do they do? They require you to go and submit facial scans, which means that the government has your facial data for everybody in the country. And then they can go and link to you online. And that's actually a really severe threat. Online anonymity is actually a great thing for many reasons. It protects us against prosecution from the government in some ways. And I think that we gotta be very careful about just simply chasing proposals because we wanna protect children. I think that that's a noble goal. I want to go and help kids be safer when they're operating in an online ecosystem, but that requires being pragmatic and understanding in terms of what kinds of proposals we should be putting forward to help better prepare our children for operating in an online ecosystem. James Janowski joining us. This brings us to some breaking news we had as we started to prepare for this program. Uh, President Biden has issued an executive order. The title of the executive order is, and I'm quoting here, addressing United States investments in certain national security technologies and products in countries of concern. They said countries of concern, but when you scroll down to the bottom of the White House page here, the annex says the countries of concern are China, Hong Kong, and Macau. This is a China executive order. Let's call it what it is. You tipped me on this 
and I hadn't remembered this, they're using what's called the IEE, IEEPA government acronyms, National Emergency Act, the International Emergency Economics Power Act. I halfway remembered it, and then you clued me up. This is something they talked about using during the TikTok ban debates. This was some stuff they talked about this. Now they're using it for this other technology. We get the big buzzwords of national security, sensitive technology. AI is going to make an appearance when they have a hearing on this. You watch. It's going to be that kind of stuff. Yep. What was your read on this executive order and how it's kind of a continuation of the running argument we're already having over technology? Yeah, I think that, you know, this was an order that was kind of long in the making and, and predictable and unsurprising that it dropped. I mean, this is just building on uh, actually one area where uh, the current administration and the past administration were actually quite hard on China um, in ways that I don't think many people realize. So uh, the administration's already put export controls on certain kinds of chip technology to China. This seems to go and further enhance that. And it's all done underneath the guise of national security. And the problem, at least for me, at face value with the national security argument particularly, because we'll see this coming up again in the fall when it comes to reauthorizing Section 702 of FISA, uh, is that it's going to be done and argued underneath national security grounds. And I think that it's important to recognize that national security is obviously important. I think that uh, a lot of Americans would want their country to be kept safe from threats that are domestic and abroad. Um, but... Uh, where's the line in, in the name of that goal, right? And when does that start, you know, encroaching on other kinds of protections that might be there, at least in the context of FISA? Um, I think that what this national security lens might be doing in this particular case is also serving as a backdrop to go and justify why you want to pursue very costly industrial policy like the CHIPS and Science Act that Congress passed last year, which afforded over $52 billion immediately for uh, you know chip manufacturers. And then it's going to cost an estimated $280 billion, I want to say, over the next 10 years um, in order to go and help increase America's competitiveness in this space. I think that you know, industrial policy has been pretty tricky. I don't think that it's had a great track record of success. Um, but I think that things like this go to try to, you know, serve as a backdrop to help bolster those efforts too. Um, so I, I think that I'm pretty hesitant when I see something like this pop up. Yeah. James Cernowski joining us. Our friend Steve Burnham over at Racket News, good friend of ours, disagrees with us a little bit on this, but I think it's worthy talking about one of the arguments he made. He pointed out, and he's going with the national security argument. He praises Biden on this. By the way, he's not a Biden supporter. This is a bipartisan thing. But I've seen other conservatives actually come out and be okay with this and folks on the right. And he pointed out that this is a combination. I'm going to quote from the piece here. We will link to it on the subsec notes. AI technology coupled with quantum technology deployed in places like in orbit, not just on the Internet, is a powerful way to break through some of our current systems. I don't disagree with all that, but this goes back to where we started this conversation. What's your definition of AI? What's your definition of quantum technology? What's your definition of delivery systems for this technology, which is the other part of AI nobody wants to talk about? You still have to deliver it, and it's still got to be a product, and how are you using that? This is all stuff in the future. I'm a little bit leery, and I can be talked into it, but I'm a little leery making policy like this on what stuff may develop into. I understand you want to be looking around the corner, but I can see some problems there, even though China and I think China is an enemy and an adversary and the Chinese government is somebody we need to treat thusly. I think it's prudent to pause there and go, well, wait a minute. We're not even sure what this technology is going to be. Should we slow down on something like this? Is that a fair position to have or where does it land with you? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think that, you know, at the end of the day, I can reckon again, I think that you're not wrong, that it's important to recognize where China is. Um, right now geopolitically um, in, in the conversation. And again, I, I just worry about it being the new red herring, if you will. You know, you think back to the 1950s and the Red Scare um, and using that to justify a lot of things. Uh, you know, you, you know, not that this is that, but, you know, you, you would see China all of a sudden becoming the new scapegoat to justify a lot of policy that might not otherwise go and uh, pass muster. So, again, I, I think that you have to be very careful about how you're creating it. And honestly, you know, the notion of to your point of like looking into the future reading glass, I think um, some people might claim that they're better at it uh, than others, but the reality is I think that we're all kind of along for the ride and um, you know, we don't actually know. The future is not necessarily certain. We, we don't have like, when people talk about AI and that, you know, uh, doomsday terminator situation, you can't even get AI experts to agree on what the timeline like that looks like. You'll have some say 10 years, some say 
20, 30 years, some say 50 years, some say 100 years. There's no consensus around any of it. So I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of understanding the capability and the timeline horizons so that we can make better informed decisions. I don't want to go and accidentally shutter off opportunities for development here because AI right now is projected to add about uh, 7% to global GDP over the next 10 years, I believe, if memory serves right. Um, and it will go and double workforce productivity, which these are massive benefits to the end consumer. And, you know, again, if we're doing proposals that have overly broad definitions for any of these technologies, we might be going and, you know, basically having us try to fight this race with both our legs tied uh, and hindering our ability to actually be the leader that we need to be. Because I'll tell you right now, it's not going to be Europe. Uh, Europe has an extremely aggressive regulatory regime that's going to discourage any kind of innovation and major investment in that space. And it's really coming down to the United States and China. And China, I think if there's one thing that we've learned about China, it's that they don't necessarily care about whatever rules that we set up and agree to with other countries, and whatever. They're just going to do China. They're going to do their own thing. And that's a legitimate thing that you have to keep in the back of your mind. Um, you know, I think some people will go and overstate where China is at that. So I think that it's a, a little bit of a balancing act to understand that they want to be competitive. but. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's a fine conversation, but we need to be more more nuanced in how we're having that conversation right now. James Arnowski joining us. This dovetails to how we started this conversation. So here's a good way to end it. A lot of this is fear. People are people are worried about AI. They're worried about what the technology is going to do. You cover this. You also write about it in really well. You go on TV and explain it to folks. When you're looking at these headlines, because the headlines are designed to get emotion from us, so we click on it or watch it or listen or whatever. So we're never going to get the fear part out of this conversation. When you're looking at the headlines, what are you looking for to get under the noise of it to, okay, this is something I need to look into, or this is just hot mess, or this is some tech bro that's trying to sell us something, or this is the government actually doing something that we need to pay attention to. What's your filters for the audience to start looking at the headlines and try to find a little bit better way of looking at this without that fear? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that you you kind of hit the nail on the head there where I, I kind of get dismayed when I see people just simply focusing on problems and not the promise of the technology. Um, I think that there's a lot of promise in AI technology. There's a great TEDx video that Saul Khan uh, from Khan Academy put out not too long ago um, where he's talking about how he thinks he can use AI to basically create a super tutor for kids um, so that way they can get a better learning education process that goes and helps them learn how to get to the right answer rather than just being told whether they're right or wrong. So I think that that's that's a phenomenal thing, especially considering how much learning loss kids had during COVID. I think that there's a phenomenal opportunity there to try to close that gap and actually really create a system that empowers kids to be best positioned to succeed and actually learn the necessary skills that they need to do. But it's not just that. They, they can go and help you with the benign tasks like you know, schedule planning and looking at travel itineraries and helping navigate food allergies in your household. And on the massive side too, it can go and help with, uh, you know, cancer research and things of that nature. So I'm always looking for like, you know, people that are identifying what what are the new great things that people are doing with this technology. Uh, drones being used to deliver life-saving medication to people on remote rural islands, right? Um, things of that nature. The more you focus on trying to figure out like what people are doing with it, um, the better. Now, obviously, to your point, there's going to be some people who go and oversell what they're doing. Uh, there was a company in the UK that was recently coming under some scrutiny for that. Um, you know, thankfully, I don't think we've had anybody going to Sam Bankman Freed levels of, of uh, trying to go and oversell what they have going on over there. But I think that, again, it's just about having a, a you know, an open mind to this whole thing here, because it's easy to go and point out problems. It's it's a lot more difficult to look past that and find what's the promise here and actually focus on getting that to become the possible. So I think that, you know, again, you just look at as many resources as possible. Um, the thing that I always look at most and for, first and foremost, too is the government you know what are they trying to do with the thing that i wrote in the new york post it was about the ftc trying to regulate around speech i think in indirectly um that's problematic so i think that you know again always keep an eye on what government's trying to do because in that space they're trying to get control over these companies and make them acquiesce to things that the government wants and i think that that would leave us all worse off
Yeah, James Arnowski, we love talking to you about this stuff. You break it down well, sir. Let folks know where they can follow you and keep up with you until we get you back on Hertel again, because I'm telling you right now, I'm going to keep having you back on as much as I can, because this stuff's just going to get more and more needed to be explained, which is a bad way of saying it, but you knew exactly what I meant, because I'm just a good communicator like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. And I'm happy to come and talk anytime with you guys about tech issues. I think that uh, they're going to become increasingly prevalent, especially as we get closer to uh, an election season where I'm sure it will certainly be part of the conversation. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, people can follow me on Twitter at James C. Or actually, sorry, I said that wrong. They can follow me on X now. <laughs> Thank you, Elon Musk, yet again. Uh, they can follow me on X at James CZ19, where I will do all the zeding or whatever it is that I'm supposed to be doing these days over there. Um, and also, I would I would strongly encourage your listeners to always listen, uh, follow Young Voices uh, on X as well uh, at Young Voices Org. They're a great organization. They I would I would not be remotely where I am today without them. So those are the two places that I would uh, encourage people to follow up. Nor would I. That they would cringe at the way we're doing our reads right at the moment because we're not exactly lighting it up today, buddy. But you do good work, sir. We will talk to you again, James Ernowski. Follow him, and we'll talk again soon, my friend. Thanks. Yes, sir. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com.